Okay. There's Judy. Judy should be in. Let's see if you I see can. me. I'll get you pinned and add you. Oh, I can't believe everybody's here. <laughs> this is so cool. Yeah. Okay. Mary Ann's trying to get in. Trying to get in. I mean, th there's her name, but no, no video. Maybe she doesn't have it on. You can do it, Mary Ann. We believe in you. <laughs> there's Sue Callahan. Hi. Hi. Hi, how are you? Hey. Good. Good, good, good. Happy to be here. Uh, oh, hi, Marianne. Marianne. There I am. Yay. Hi, Marianne. Hi. <laughs> All right. So these are the nine artists from the show that I know are going to be joining us. Um, it's just after two o'clock, so I want to welcome everyone. Um, this is the Ohio Arts Council's Expanded Dimension. Uh, creative conversation. So we have nine of the 10 artists here to talk to each other about the show, about their work, about each other's work, about what it means to be a part of this exhibition. Um, this was curated by Tracy Rieger. Um, she may join us later. She has, she just texted me back, so we'll see. Um, but yeah, I want to open it up to the artists to talk about first what your experience is in coming into the thought of, of being part of this show. Like what, um, many of you made new work for it. Um, some of you have existing work that was pulled in for it. I just love to hear you um, wax poetic with each other on what you brought to the show and, and what you discovered through that. And also those that are, are uh, joining us as uh, viewers, feel free to type questions. Um, we'll be happy to insert those into the conversation, no problem. So, how that? Well, I can say from being there after a lot of the work was up that it was a freaking magical experience. It, I have never been in a environment where I really felt as um, I want to say held, but I think supported makes more sense in the context. But um, just, it was like, you know, you walk from one end of it and you see um, um, Deb's work and you go through Sue's work and you come out the other side into this opening that's open and airy. And it's just, and you walk through it. It's just amazing. Just the way everything worked together was just, I mean, I think about it and I still, get um you know cold sweaty palms just thinking about it um. I, I agree Judy it was so I feel so lucky absolutely lucky that I was able to be in the space and walk through and see everyone's work in person and really appreciate how so many pieces really spoke to other pieces in the exhibit how colors jumped from one to another um, how reuse of materials jump from one to another. It's, um, yeah, I think that it, it, it's a really quite an honor to be in an exhibit with all of you. <laughs> Likewise, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Likewise. <laughs> yeah. Mind blowing, right? Yeah. Well, it, it's kind of funny to think that we all probably went to QSDS thinking, well, I'm going to make this little quilt, you know, and use some fabric <laughs> up, and, and then all this stuff happens, and we've got huge parachutes and recycled clothes. It's like, it, it is magic. So if I can just share, I used to teach for the University of Maryland, or I taught for the University of Maryland for a long time. And I used to go to graduation and I would, we had to dress in regalia. And I always felt like an imposter. I always felt like, okay, any minute now, they're gonna go, you over there, out, you don't belong here. And that's the way I felt looking at all your work. Oh, oh my gosh, <laughs> that, that, that's silly. <laughs> 
<laughs> you don't I feel that way right now. Didn't you know? I didn't hear that end coming. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> I heard, I felt like I was finally there. I was right. supported with my people. <laughs> well, I'm really jealous of those that got to see the exhibit Me in too. person. Yeah. But Kat and, and Amy did such a good job of representing it online. It, oh, yeah. Yeah. Fabulous. I don't know if you had to uh, invent some of that stuff at the beginning of the pandemic, <laughs> or especially for it, or you both were experts in it to begin with. So, <laughs> well, you did. I, I think, in a way, the way that it was uh, videoed and the virtual tour actually is, uh, in some ways, kind of as good as being there in person because the virtual tour gave you more insight and actually slowed slowed me down. And I, it was because I saw that before I actually went into the gallery. Um, it, it was a really great um, backdrop for knowing to look a little closer in this area and that area and to walk underneath Judy Rush's great huge domes and um, to stick my nose in, um, Susan Kavanaugh's pieces. Sorry, Susan, I didn't, you know, disrupt anything. But uh, I mean, it's just such a uh, installation as a whole, and I think the 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 virtual aspects of it really um, was quite tremendous. And I hope that um, the Rife Gallery and and other galleries continue to do that, provide virtual tours. Um, yeah, we definitely found that, that to be important. Thank you so much for affirming that. Absolutely, we will continue. And it was much, it was professionally done as opposed to other ones. It was nice to be, really nice to be part of this, especially since I couldn't be there in person. I guess, you know, some of us live not that far, but a little too far to even go experience something like that. And it was really nice to be able to do that online. I'm honored to be with all of you. <laughs> <laughs> well said. And it's good you know, to during see all the, of you. Yes. During the, it, on the professionalism while we were having those, the talks inside the studio, the whole thing was so professionally done. I really felt like I was um, in an organization that was taking care of people and making sure that they had, that the information, the right information got out. So that was, that was really a joy, Kat. That was great. And plus the preparers, whew, they were wonderful. <laughs> yeah, so talk a little bit, um, Sue, before the, the larger group came in, you had said some interesting things um, about the setup of the exhibition and, and things that you were noticing as you were going through. Would you, would you mind going back to that and chatting a little bit about it? Well, I, I was just mentioning that um, uh, uh, to Andrea that when when my piece went up and that I was standing back to look, I was so pleased that there's a little bit of stitching that I did in neon orange and it's just at the right location that you can see that and then glance over to to, to, to Andrea's piece and go, oh, it just that neon orange is taken over. And that happened between other pieces as well, where this color is picked up from um, uh, from from Judy's uh, uh, vessels hanging above over to Sue Benner's uh, uh, amazing shoulder pads, and it just it just kept coming, you know, uh, being re reinforced throughout how pieces spoke to each other. Uh, pretty amazing. And that says a lot too about uh, Tracy's curating of the show. And uh, how the how everything worked together, and of course the installation, the great installation of the show, and and the honoring of the space and the pieces in the space and all of that. So, um, was, I have a question. I, was, it, okay. I can, go ahead. Well, was the building ever open? I know it is it a federal property or a state property. Was it ever open? To, did, did you ever get any foot traffic? It wasn't open to the public, but. Um, we've had lots of engagement virtually, so that's been really lovely. Sorry, Sue. That, that's oh. fine. That's fine. It also was interesting how the textures spoke to each other. I mean, uh, subtle textures in some and, and really um, yeah, quite uh, um, 
quite amazing textures and others, but they all they all uh, sp speak to each other. I mean, I can't imagine an exhibit being better uh, a better cohesive exhibit with differences and yet um, and yet they all seem to belong there. I don't think there's any mistake around that. I think we knew this was coming, and there was some you know connection between all of us that pushed us towards that end. Plus, we had such great curators in there um, and yeah. preparers helping us to organize and design the space. But I think the collective is very obvious in this show and how we all um, mindfully worked together, but not really, right? I mean, it shows in the cohesiveness. Sure, yeah. And the contrast of the mm -hmm. textures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was thinking about it before we got on the call of just like, <clears throat> the differences of kind of um, depths of field or um, from wall growing out or then like immersion in in the space or then there's moments of like really like opaque like opaque moments and then um, really translucent moments um, like a, a lot of weight maybe visually like heavier forms or like seeing gravity and then like weightlessness so I like to think about how we're all working in relatively the same realm of, of soft materiality, but all these different iterations coming together and, and forming kind of new, new observations and new conversations for, for me to think about in my own work. Mm -hmm. yeah, Andrea, I agree. I agree. I was thinking about that idea of sort of contrast when I was going through the virtual exhibition and something that I kept thinking about was this idea of like breath, like mm -hmm. this like inhale and contraction, like seeing all the detail and then like this exhale, seeing like the scale of some pieces. And I think that adding to that feeling of like expansion and contraction, um, like the the wide photos versus the detail shots sort of bring you into this feeling of both um, like expansion and then this feeling of, of detail. And, and I love what you said about gravity too. I feel like that gravity has something to do with that as well. But yeah, I felt like there was such a great pace that allowed you to appreciate the differences in the work and then the things that would bring them together. Yeah, I really I love, enjoyed I looking the at the light and shadow, how everybody plays a little differently. Not everybody is hanging things mm -hmm. on the wall. It's off the wall, off the ceiling. It, it was fun to look at things that way. Well, I found that when I went around and, and um, looked at everything, one of the things that I always love doing, and I've gotten in trouble for it because I do stick my nose too close to think works of art, but is to like ponder how was this made? Like uh, um, Andrea, I, I don't know what kind of sewing machine you have or how much that thing weighs, the huge piece is just so all encompassing. And, um, and then Amanda, your pieces are so fragile yet large and, and their environments, but, and, and the contrast of the two um, with this, you know, solid weight and then temporal for fragility. I mean, I think it's just really, and, and it's with all of them, like Judy's and Sue's pieces, it's all kind of based, it's all this bouncing around of how was this put together? How was it made? How, what is the actual weight of it? What was this actually like, Sue, what kind of needle did you use? Did you hand put all of those shoulder pads? How tired your hands were making that. Um, I mean, just how were these pieces made? Um, I wanted to, you know, get my nose up to Susan's pieces and actually try to smell everything. Um, but I think that's just a really beautiful, I, I don't know, I, I enjoy experiences like that. One thing I, I don't like is going into a gallery and it's like, eh, you know, painting, 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 sculpture painting. And, and you know, it's all just kind of in your, you know, a one-liner in a way. I, I think that everything that was in here was far more complex and, than a, than a one-line. Not to pat or <laughs> pat or all that, but you know, hey, go us. Yeah, pat away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is one of my favorite questions, though. Like, how is this made? Mm -hmm. that, that is, is a good way to enter into the work. Yeah. And how long did it figure? Mm -hmm. How long did it take somebody to figure out how to make it? You know. Right. How, how are those processes developed and, and the problem solving and uh, which is really 
the great fun of it. And uh, I just I just see over and over again in this show, you know, all these different soft materials, different materials used in different ways, assembled in different ways, and but all speaking a language that uh, is, uh, as somebody said before, is as unified. And that's, uh, I, I just, I just am so happy to be a part of this. And, you know, this kind of goes back to, too, all the years of QSDS and all the years of being a part of that and seeing this uh, field and medium develop over the years and how students came and teachers came and directors and and organizers and all the work that went into this that created this concentrated Columbus, Ohio community for this kind of work. Agreed. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So thanks QSDS. No, oh, without a doubt. Yeah. And also QSDS has done so much to elevate um, the, the craft and in people's minds and our own minds and take it. I mean, QSDS was the impetus for our success, I believe, and our mm -hmm. community. So I think, um, I think without it, I wouldn't have attempted as much as I have attempted, uh, well, not even one tenth. Of it. Yeah, I don't think, I'm, I'm almost positive I wouldn't be the artist I was, I am right. without the teachers, you know, without the teachers that I've taken, Sue, one of them is right here, Sue Benner. I mean, nice. I've taken classes and I've learned so much. And also, you know, I tell people this, the air that you breathe at QSDS feeds you. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a cook, so I use that analogy a lot, but I mean, just everything about QSDS feeds you. It's, and I missed it so much last year. It fed me for a year creatively it would charge me it would nourish me and i mean all of that and i i'm going to point at sue benner who said susan you need to use your own photographs you told me to do that and that created a series of 30 pieces that i had two solo shows with that wouldn't have happened without the teachers at qsds or just me going to qsds courage you know, it, they give us courage it's the environment yeah. there yeah, yeah, and it's nice to see how everybody's work has changed over the years too. And don't and forget, don't women know every year. What women when we when this the whole thing started had um, less of a voice than we do today. So I think you know that we have reflected that um, that that development. I think in the craft. So can I we just rant? Can I just rant a little bit today on P uh, NPR? somebody talked about the term sewist because now men are sewing and they don't want to be called seamstresses so we're calling them sewists and i just wanted to kick the radio i just did oh. <laughs> can't we have something that's just ours well they also made the point susan that uh the word sewer yeah could also be read out sewer and that would be so <laughs> terrible and of course most of us know that and oftentimes take pictures of sewers yeah. and go <laughs> Yes, yeah, it is humorous. Here they are They're... honoring all of us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I'd like to say that, I mean, my background is painting. And if I hadn't actually met my dear friend, Kate Gorman, who got me into the Art Quilt Network, um, I wouldn't have followed the fiber work that I do. And it's part of the... Um, the artists that seem to be drawn into doing fiber work that are some of the most welcoming and um, nourishing and inspiring humans that I've come across, which is, you know, I, I've been mostly, I, I mean, I, okay, so I'm going to admit that I've been making work um, in the way I have as a fiber artist so that I can, you know, stay with the cool crowd and <laughs> continue to fit in yeah. with wonderful, amazing, um, quite, you know, not entirely all women, but, you know, strong artists um, that are incredibly inspiring. And it's a different kind of community that 
um, than from what I experienced, like with the, the painters I know, or, or you know, other other more uh, academically, you know, embraced um, art forms. Um, it, this is just a really and all, and it's really um, apparent when you go to something like QSDS, where you see all of these people come together, and it's just like one big, powerful pot of, of a lot of women um, and women who are are not stereotypical, you know, Midwest Americans or whatever. I mean, it, these are incredible people to to come across, and it's it's been changing. It has changed my trajectory tremendously. I agree, Debbie, and I want to say Mary Ann Tipple, thank you so much for sharing so many of your art supplies over the years when I would get to sit next to you in an USDS <laughs> class. And uh, yeah. We'll, we'll never forget <laughs> Ned Wirt, will we? <laughs> we will not forget <laughs> Ned Wirt. That's absolutely right. Yes, yes. But you know, like 20... Two years ago, I, I started going to classes at Second City for improv. And you learn, you learn about groupthink and about how there's a connection in the group. And you, and you work to, you do all these exercises so you can feel the other person. And the um, thing about QSDS is it, it kind of happens organically that I think we do get into this group think and you know play off of each other and it's like wow you know and there's not like jealousy and I don't know competitiveness I guess <laughs> but there is fear because you know, I would have thought you guys were a fearsome lot for the longest time I was intimidated by everybody for the longest time Judy well, I thought right. you were pretty scary <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't believe I'm in a show with Judy Rush. Oh my God. Yeah. No way. Oh yeah. No way. <laughs> oh, you know, it's like the first time you get in Quilt National and you're like, oh my God, they must have made a mistake, you know? <laughs> and then you're like, oh no, wait a minute. Maybe I am that good. <laughs> and then what did you think by the third and fourth time, Marianne? Well, the third did time you I... I've only got up to the third time, so it's only, like, only the third time. Only. <laughs> so, what did you think the third time? By the third time, you were selected. Oh my God! They made another mistake. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sakes, Mary and I so enjoyed listening to your artist talk. Um, well, I love yours too. It's like oh, I love her pictures. I, yeah, love those. I said a lot of ums, but I really enjoyed um, how you. Um, showed some of the close-ups of your work. I, I, I would love to see a whole body of your work together. Um, it's, and, and the narrative that you have behind it and the personal stories you have behind it, really, I find um, just beautiful. And your relationship with your mother and taking care of, uh, you know, experience I mean, the aging um, of your loved ones. Well, hopefully, um, Zanesville Museum of Art has offered me a solo show probably wow. next fall so Excellent. Wow. Yeah. We're hoping it happens. we've been working on it for almost a year now so yeah. nice i told so them I, i'll have all new work by then <laughs> but let's also recognize cat and all of her support and all the other galleries wow. that's taken a risk on fiber and i'll even go so far as to say quilts because a lot of people, you know, I don't usually, I don't, I don't usually say that I'm a quilter. I say that I'm an artist. And then if anybody cares and asks me more questions, I go on and on and on. But, you know, th th there are galleries that don't even want to listen to us, don't even want to see our work, you know, and, and diminish because it's woman's work or whatever you want to call it. And so a gallery like the Rice, I mean, when I heard the work was going to be in the Rice Gallery, I, and I said to you, Kat, I usually say yes first and then figure out how to do it second. But I mean, the Wright Gallery is an amazing gallery. Mm -hmm. It really is. It's, and I'm just, I was yeah. so thrilled to be asked to be part of it. Now we are. How oh, long yeah. has the association of the Wright Gallery uh, gone on with QSDS? It's been. So they've had, they've had some shows. Um, I would say they've 
probably had maybe um, four exhibitions. Now that may not be the exact number, but I know that there is some uh, really great history with yeah. the organization. Um, and that's over a span of over 30 years. So, yeah. Oh yeah, that's great. Well, I know I was in one a few years ago at the Rife and I still get hits Oh, I'll look up, this is so egocentric, but I'll look, oh. I, uh, I look up my name, you know, and I'll see the links <laughs> to the right cool. gallery. It's like, this is cool. <laughs> now, I recall being in a show years ago there also, Mariana. Maybe we were in the same show. I don't remember. Could have been. But it's a, it's a big thing. It's like, I'm going to be the right. I know. Yeah, very across big. From the Capitol. It's so cool. <laughs> we are so I, lucky in Ohio to have the Ohio Arts Council and, and the Greater Columbus Arts Council that, you know, support arts to the degree that they do. Um, so thank yeah. you, Ohio Arts Council. Thank you, Rife Gallery. Thank right. you, Ohio, for supporting the arts in these ways. We have a, we have a great um, support system, even. Um, one time I got, was it for this show? I don't think so, but I got a card or I got a letter from a um, state representative. Yeah, a commendation. Is that what it was? Mm -hmm. Was it for this show yeah. or was it for something else? It may have been. I think it was for something else. Could have been for something else. <laughs> right, a while ago, a while ago. But um, that was pretty impressive. I was like, who is this guy? You know? He's your legislature. So. Um, I don't think he was mine. Or maybe he is the way the state is gerrymandered, so maybe. <laughs> but I don't think I live in a in a pretty um, blue district. So. so, folks, when you're thinking about this exhibition and um, the works that were pulled together, were there um, were there things that that came to the fore that you hadn't expected? That maybe connections in the work, um, whether concepts or um, narrative that you all, all gleaned from that or special surprises that you got that you wanted to ask each other about? Hmm. You know that low cat that we were talking about? <laughs> That's got me some. Susan, I'll ask you, I'm, when I saw your piece, um, well, it's a, it's a beautiful piece, but also in this time of COVID, I, it almost brought me to tears because of thinking of all of these people behind the scenes who you honor in your piece, who work in the restaurant business, uh, who are hurting so much right now. And, uh, and since you do so many pieces related to the restaurant work, uh, I, I don't know whether you have anything to say about that. Well, it's very painful. I mean, it, it is, you know, as a teacher in hospitality, so many of my students have lost their job, you know, or my graduates have lost their job. So it's not just rest. And my, both of my sons ran restaurants and one of them left the industry mm -hmm. altogether because they just, you know, well, for one, it was just time, but it's very tough. And, and, you know, it's, and I'm very active in the food scene in my, in my region and it is very tough and, and it's not going to get any better at least for six months, at least, you know, it's just not. And it's, it's, it's sad, you know, and I don't want to get political, but it's just sad. I think, you know, I love to cook and I love to be at home and I, <laughs> I, and I'm sick of it. I'm sick of cooking. <laughs> I, I bet you, it, but, and yet we take it, we take it for granted that all of those meals, all those, and Columbus has amazing, I love coming to Columbus and eating. And all of those people are hurting. Yeah. They're just all hurting. And whether you can open up a restaurant again, are you going to find that staff? You know, you know. Uh, again, culinary and chefs—they're leaving the industry in droves for a lot of reasons. They let you know there was a talent pool shortage to begin with, and now it's just going to be even harder. It really is. If you're interested, look what Danny Myers has to say. One of the most successful restaurateurs in the nation. And he, you know, he doesn't, and uh, he doesn't know how some of his restaurants are going to come back. So, yeah. 
Good stuff. And I, and I thought of a similar kind of thing, uh, Amanda, with your work and looking at home, because mm -hmm. home means a little something different to us, I think, in this last year than it did, um, you know, a year ago. Yeah, it, it's it's amazing with those pieces. Like I made those pieces like 10 years ago now. And um, like the, the way that the meaning of that work has shifted, like they started out sort of as this diary and then um, there was a financial crash and housing became unstable. So there was this looked like towards that. And then uh, this is the first time they've been displayed since the pandemic started. And I think that the meaning, you're right, it has sort of, change like the way that I think of my interior spaces is, is totally totally different like the amount of time um, that we spend in these spaces and and then I also think about like the way that the materiality of the the piece sort of reflects you know stability and instability and mm -hmm. wow. yeah so it, yeah I feel, I feel like this exhibition and even the fact that it's virtual um or that I've only experienced it in a virtual way I think that that also highlights this sort of different time we're in but it, it's something that like is very intriguing to me the way that um like whatever's outside the artwork um can influence its meaning and I I feel it with these pieces Well, that, that just proves it's good work when it can, you know, the work stays the same, but the meanings grow with it. Mm -hmm. This makes it a better, even better pieces, you know. Yeah, and there's something about the artwork having a life outside of what I might have really intentionally meant it to be, like this controlled, like, this is about me. Um, it's it's nice to see that the work can sort of change um, and have a life of its own. I've been wondering how the how people's work has changed, or their working, their practice has changed, or their thought process has changed since the pandemic started. Because this was all planned ahead of time before and then postponed once, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, uh, I, I mean, we as artists are, are very lucky in that most of our work can be done by ourselves or with a small group of people. Um, but I, it's still affected by it. So I just wonder about that. I mean, it personally I, I, became oh, manic. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry, I'll just say I'll just speak to that question. I think this is a really um, important question. I, I've been thinking about it a lot during the pandemic and also just all the political and social unrest. Um, I have felt a greater need to be in making and really, really leaning on it as catharsis and almost like like Wednesday I found myself I'm like I just need to sew it was like stress sewing and like I was like stress sewing and stress baking and stress cleaning because I'm like I'm trying to find some control in this like lack of control chaotic moment um and because I have my studio at home and you know but it's also like kind of in fits and starts now because it's like well I've been I've had moments where I'm teaching remotely and also teaching my daughter homeschool and so it's like just I'm I'm just having to find like little moments, but lots of little moments during the day to be making my work as a way to like help myself through this time. And three have of you my pieces I made specifically for this show. Oops, sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, it's okay. <laughs> I was just gonna say three of my pieces I made for this show, and because it was delayed, I was able to get far more obsessive and. Um, so basically I, the pieces I made, I worked on, you know, the plan was to work on them until it's time for the show. So because it got delayed, they just got a whole lot more stitched and layered on. So I would the coronavirus, like at least to where, you know, the pieces ended up at, you know, were, was a big time was a big factor in, in what I, what ended up, you know, coming out of that. I also think we spend a lot of time by ourselves, right? We're alone. We work alone a lot of time. And this has forced us into alone space, thinking differently. Right? We use our thought process 
before the pandemic was one thing and we can't help but change our, our perspective that way. And also we've been denied our uh, the opportunity. I, uh, I, for one, am enjoying not talking to um, you know people that influence outside my house because I'm just pretty much of an introvert as I age. And um, I am thinking about the work so much different, just be, just the interactions around, in my case, the fiber, how the fiber interacts and how that, um, what the implications of that interaction are around in, in the world in general, and actually just the physics of interaction and, mm. and of, you know, the actual science of it and the emotion of it and the energy of it. And I, I, I think it all works from my point of view with the, what's going on with the virus. But it, you know, it goes back to that control thing. We feel like we need to have control, but we know that we don't have that control, even in making work. We think we're making work and it never really turns out the way that we wanna, uh, want it to in our head, but we work with that whole, a whole fluid development because you know, we're, we're limited by the technical aspects sometimes. And um, you know, the COVID virus. Anybody who's worked with glitter knows how COVID spreads, right? <laughs> right? So that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Stays fiber is the same way. Fiber is the same way. When you work with fibers, they're everywhere. They fly. Well, so we have fiber. had a couple of, of comments and questions come in from the audience from Laurel. Um, Laurel has a couple of comments and questions. All the art in the show was just stunning. Such an honor to get to see it, especially during this time when seeing beautiful things is limited. It's been way too long since I've been in a gallery. I'd like to ask, what is it? What is the material in the quilt behind Sue Benner? And did Sue Callahan print the order forms on the white material? And did Andrea Myers add color strips on top of the blues? I.e. was the blue strips a huge, large rectangle? And then you see, and then the see-through ephemeral furniture, what material is that made out of? It's all, it was all fascinating. I'm not an artist, just a person who appreciates it. So lots of questions in there, rapid fire. You all can go for it however you like. Or be quiet, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll just, mine is a simple answer. Mine is a print on demand. It was designed on a computer, print on demand, and then it was painted with food. So it was mustard and ketchup and uh, jam and balsamic vinegar. So yeah, it was print on demand and designed on a computer. So cool. Can I ask your question, Susan, related to that? Did you preserve the food you put on your fabric, was that before or after printing? Oh, it was after printing. You know, Did I printed you put it, anything I, to preserve it on there? No, it's a prayer flag. You know, it's, and that's, you know, it's a prayer flag. So I, it was meant to hang and almost look destroyed. So, you know, that's, it's going to, like the mustard crusted and then fell off, <laughs> which I know is kind of gross, but it sort of, it sort of made it. I mean, it was just, it was, I have to say it was inspiration because I was going to paint it. And then I was like, nah, that doesn't work. So I, you know, I went and grabbed coffee grounds out of the office and started rubbing. I'm like, oh yeah, this works. So yeah. It's I, think it's, I think it was perfect. And we all know how food stains, especially wine, but um, yeah, I, I thought it was just absolutely perfect. And that's the way it would look in the kitchen, you know, and I don't know if you've ever seen like the line of tickets in the window is, you know, it's just, mm -hmm. that's what it is. And again, the people, like there was one woman in QSDS who walked in, who was a food service person like me. And she goes, oh my God, that's brilliant. And I was like, oh my God, somebody gets it. So yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask a question, actually, if I could just real quickly from uh, about Diane, do you, re do your pieces, do you reconstruct them in different configurations um, when you every time you show them, or do, or do you? Is that something that you you do? Um, 
No, there, once I make a piece, it's done for the most part. Okay. I make, I do make a lot of the strips ahead of time and then think about what I'm going to do with them. Yeah. That's how I work. If that's, does that, is that what you're looking at? Yeah. I mean, I just, I, I really like the, um, they kind of reminded me of, of, um, oh my gosh, I can't think of, um, I can't think of the game it is, it, but it reminds me of, you know, games that I enjoyed as a child of stacking things together. Pick yeah. Up. Yeah. No, I would um, pick up sticks. I just, I started doing that a little bit after I took, went to Nancy Crows and she kept mm -hmm. on talking about strip piecing. Mm -hmm. My form of strip piecing, I guess. I make yeah. strips and figure it out after. Yeah, I really enjoyed this. Yeah, they made big, they were very full of substance and each strip seemed like an object to me. Um, I like that part of it. When you ship them, you ship them in a modular form, right? To be able to put back together, Diane? You no, don't ship it that ship sh whole shape. They're shipped complete. Oh, really? Yeah, well, except I delivered to the show because shipping since all this has happened has yeah. gotten outrageously right. expensive. Yeah, right. And right. no, I had my attempts at doing things modular to try and ship have never worked. I always do oh, something, I screw it up and it's like, <laughs> I made one that I was gonna sandwich, you know, it was gonna fold and, well, actually one of the ones in the show, the tic-tac-toe does fold on top of each other. So it's larger, but everything is complete. I've found if I have tried to send it for someone to assemble, it never quite works. Yeah. All right, so in that in that string of questions, there was a question to Sue Benner. Uh, she'd like to know what that quilt behind you is made of. Oh, this one. I think so. <laughs> I was thinking, I have no idea if there's a quilt behind mine. No. I think literal. I think we're talking literal. Okay, so uh, I'll do that. Uh, this is cotton fabric and uh, it, these are all dye painted, dye printed, mono printed, and paint over printed cottons of various sorts. And it's not a quilt yet, <laughs> <laughs> but it made a good background and it could be up here for a year. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm, uh, it's, it's the uh, it's the prairie grassland idea that I hauled out of a box, and uh, about two months ago, and I'm just looking at until I can figure out what to do with it. That's great. And Andrea, the question about your piece on whether it were they were colored strips on top of a blue background. No, that's a good question. Um, I, I work in sections that are roughly, I don't know, uh, one foot by two feet and then they're paneled together. So where there's color in the piece, those are just, it's just pure color. There's not um, the denim behind those, but there is a backing cloth that I use. It's a canvas drop cloth material. So I'll sew the strips of fabric onto those and then panel them together. Yeah. And then Amanda, I think uh, they wanted to know what your ephemeral furniture is made out of. So those pieces are made out of polyester thread. Um, and then the way that they're made is I sew into water soluble fabric and create sort of structures um, while I'm also creating the picture. So I'm sort of um, putting lines in different directions and shading with my sewing machine. And then I dissolve the base. So they're all thread, the pieces that are hanging up. Wonderful. All right. And then we have um, from Melinda, Andrea and everyone, do you see a change in your work? Is it calmer, less calm, more painful, more peaceful, more question, 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 whatever that change may be? That's a really good question. <laughs> um, 
I'm just looking at it and thinking about it. I, I think it really depends on the day and pre-pandemic, um, I, I would say the same thing, but I think the, the extremities that we're living in right now, I mean, when, when the pan pandemic was first starting, I just needed to start collaging really quickly to make a bunch of work um, just to keep my hands busy. So I, I think it's much like we've experienced like fatigue moments in the pandemic. I, I see my energy has kind of um, gotten really like a lot of energy and then kind of like uh, kind of fatigue to it, but just continually making. So I, I think I would agree that my work has done all of those things during this time. <laughs> I, I think my experience has been a lack of focus. Um, I left my job after almost 15 years and that was planned. So, but, you know, being off a tether and then uh, the, but the bonus that I got was I take care of my grandchildren now because both of my children are essential employees. So I have four little boys with me a lot. And so, you know, it, it's hard to kind of think about what I want to do when I have all of those little people around me. Um, so it's been, un it has been unfocused, but the, the pleasure in that is that I've done so many other things that I had never been able to do before. My 13 year old grandson introduced me to hydro dipping and I, I was like, I don't know what that is, but sure, let's do it. So if you don't know what hydro dipping is, you can Google it and find it on YouTube. It's messy, it's, you know, it, but it, again, I walnut dyed, I did paper mache. I mean, I think being unfocused for a year has been great in, in many ways, you know, because I explored without being, well, I have to do this for this, or I have to do that for that. And, you know, not teaching has been really kind of, Okay, too. <laughs> <laughs> Writing papers, you missed that. Oh. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I was a cooking teacher, so I was eating bad student cooking. So uh -oh. <laughs> that has Project. some pleasure to it. Yeah. I saw the question about how are these staying up there? And uh, the fabric that's underneath it is felt. Flannel works, cotton flannel works even better, but this is felt. And there's just enough friction with the cotton fabrics that they stay up on their own, uh, but not all the time. <laughs> so occasionally they fall down. But it's a great way to, great way to work. I love looking at everybody's background. It's with intention, I think. How about everybody else? How are you? Um, have you noticed any difference in your work or in the way you work in the last year? I haven't, but I, I was really sick the beginning of last uh, winter. I think the month of February was in and out of hospitals, and I. Ooh. Finally got out of the hospital like a week after COVID really hit and the nurses were all like, ah, we're not coming in your room. And the doctors would come in with the masks on and stand like six feet away from you like, oh, I don't want to get anything from you or give it to you. So um, I, I'm just glad to be home and it was peaceful and I had stuff to work on and it's like, at this point, I'm glad to be alive. So, yes, <laughs> me too, Mary. You know, I, I've survived. I did a lot I of mask making at the beginning. Not Ma my oh. work. I made a lot, hundreds of masks and donuts. Yeah, right. And then it's it just a lot of hard to, it's still hard to focus. My studio's become, I'm work from home now, and I'm, I had to give up some of my workspace and studio space for work. So I feel like I'm jam packed and not working how I normally work. I closed down my studio at the beginning of the pandemic, right at the beginning of the. So I went from 500 square feet to, I don't know, 100 square, not even 100 square feet, maybe 75 square feet. And um, I, it's for me, it's been great. I like. You know, as I get older, I get more and more introverted. 
And I just have been enjoying this, uh, this uh, working in a smaller space, working on smaller things and smaller ideas that actually I created the, sh the work in the show um, in that smaller space with those smaller ideas. And, but put together, they, they come together as a larger unit, but it's, you know, I think, and also I think that we, um, at least for me, I'm at a point in my life where I'm thinking of slowing down, retiring, I'm giving up jobs every year. I give up another job, it seems like. And um, this year, I think I'm gonna be out of jobs completely and no responsibility around the studio. And that's freeing. That's been really freeing for me. So more time with just with people that I love to be with and making friends with people that I wanna get to know rather than um, be having to be in a world that requires me to network in order to succeed. So this whole slowing down business for me has really um, been good and COVID has supported that transition. I, I can't say I've slowed down, but I did move my studio also uh, to, uh, to pre pretty much to home, I guess. Um, I finished my piece for the Rife before moving out of my big studio that was uh, across the river and um, um, in an old factory wooden. building. And, um, uh, but I've, I've been really busy and I had some people ask me, oh my goodness, does that mean you're not going to work that big in the future? And I don't think it means that. Um, I think I can still make some big things just differently, but also if the right opportunity came along, it doesn't mean that I wouldn't necessarily be able to rent another big studio somewhere in order to do a particular piece. So, so it kind of leaves the future kind of open and free and who knows what it's going to bring and I'm okay with that. I, I should say also, I'm so, I feel so lucky to be an artist during these times because I know people who are bored who are just staying home is driving them crazy and I still have more ideas of things that I could do than I could possibly ever do and I think that's a real blessing. Mm -hmm. um, for myself I've had to really rely on just determination to keep making things. I work 40 hours a week with a long commute and um, the challenge of keeping a program going for uh, for people with developmental disabilities during COVID and keeping them safe and getting them to the studio and getting them with all oh, the supports that aren't, that aren't necessarily functioning um, has been really, really challenging. And a lot of times my inclination is to come home and want to go to bed or bury myself in a murder mystery and just you know try to like not think about things. And so it's been a big challenge to me. Uh, it's been kind of exhausting, um, but I, I'm, you know, I'm a stubborn person. I'm not willing to not make art, but it, it's been a bit more of a, I, I can say it's been, a, it's been a challenge to, to keep going through every day. Um, and I love my job. I, and I'm very proud that we've been able to keep our studio open and have some folks come and come safely and be able to, uh, because for, for those folks being, the people that are, um, come to the studio with disabilities, for them to be uh, isolated at home can, is very devastating for some of them. So I feel really strongly about my job, but it's also really kind of emotionally taxing. And um, um, it, it is, it's been hard to come back home and then not just want to go um, But I um, show you know, because I had a deadline, I had to make stuff. So I didn't really have that option. So thank you very much. I'm glad that I was really forced into, you know, picking myself up and make it, keep making stuff. I'm also very lucky. I, I am a part of a group of artists and we've been meeting once a week on Zoom for a couple hours and, um, and sharing what we're doing. And so that also is a motivation, uh, but also ideas come out of that. And in fact, we've done a couple uh, exquisite corpses where, <laughs> where we're doing them by mail and, uh, uh, and it's been fun, you know, it's like, yeah, now, and now for something totally different, you know?
the beginning of the pandemic, I, you know, was home a lot more because of um, not traveling and teaching workshops. And at first I was, oh my, I can finally finish all these projects in my studio. And I never consider like unfinished projects a problem because I really, I mean, I've been doing this so long and my, I've worked on lots of different ideas over the years and some of them I've kind of wrapped up and others I haven't. And I just, I just plowed into about five different series of things that were kind of left hanging. I thought, well, maybe not any new ideas, but I could finish up some old stuff. And uh, it was, it, it was, it was cathartic because it kept my hands busy and there was a continuation of things. And then I kind of ran out of steam. Uh, so I was really, at some point I was reinvigorated and, uh, but I have to say that right now again, I think I thought this would be over. Yeah. And so, you know, pacing yourself, you go, oh, well, now I need to rethink this. I need to reevaluate and see where this is going. And, uh, and then uh, make some plans. <laughs> I need to make some plans, <laughs> throw it out there somehow. Well, I think also, Sue, especially, you know, when we're in community, the, like I said in the beginning, the community feeds us. So, and, I, and I'm actually doing this uh, writing project and, and to write, you have to read because you have to get the right words. And so, and the words feed you and then you put the words out on the paper. And so it's really difficult to be, not to be nourished by beauty, by art. I mean, yes, I've gone on walks and I swim and I'm, I'm nourished, but my, my world that I valued so much, which is the interior of a kitchen and not always my own, it, it been, I've been deprived of that. So, you know, I'm not a landscape person. I'm not a, I'm not a this, I'm not a that. So, you know, we do have to feed ourselves, And that's probably been the hardest part is to be denied of the physical presence of, of each other. Um, and even if, and I, and uh, Deborah, I worked in homeless services. So I know the intensity of working in that environment and it's so draining. And so you do have, and you want to come home and you want to put on your slippers and, you know, I don't drink, but I mean, and drink. So the idea is to find a way to feed yourself through all of this. It's that I think has been the biggest challenge. And I'm, I'm working on a, I, I, I'm working on a side project and that has really helped me. I'm working on a, a book of my photographs and uh, but all the correspondence has to be done by by email and phone call. And I turned the photographs over to the book designer. And I was so relieved that there was going to be somebody else to coordinate with. And that's, you know, that collaboration and that coordination that I would even have somebody else adding energy into the project. So um, I think that's, you know, we get that collaboration, that having energy and yeah, the time alone is good, but I'm uh, looking forward to more collaboration. So Sue, in line with that during the um, installation, the young women that helped me to install um, the, the installation, talk about the um, energy and filling filling me up after that long drought. It was amazing. I walked out of there. I didn't want to even influence how they hung it because uh, the energy around the working together was so, yeah. so filling up in that drought. So I think they did an exceptional fun job. It was fun working with them. Amanda, how has um, how has your work changed? Has it changed through this year? Um, yeah, I I guess what COVID has given me is like a bit of breath to do like weird 
weirder things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, um, so often I feel Weird. like, I, yeah, or just like experiment in a different way. I think a lot of times now I'm just working towards a deadline and I'm rushing towards a deadline. And um, I think what COVID allowed me was some time to just play and to do some things that I haven't done before. Like I've I've been designing some fabrics with like my embroidery scanned um, and then getting those fabric those fabrics printed and then trying to make clothes. Like I've never made clothes before. Um, and I think um, I'm not good at it. And <laughs> that's great actually like to be a be beginner um, at something like teaches me about like myself and how frustrated I can get, but also like what it's like to learn something new and you know, you install a zipper and it's so cool. <laughs> um, so, so there's been a bit of that. And then I've also felt similar things like this sort of like energy to get things done and then like a slowing down. Um, but one interesting thing that's happened during COVID is I've, d I did my first outdoor installation with fabric and that was at a request from Harbor Front Center in Toronto. They wanted something outdoors in the trees that was light. And so that sort of gave me this challenge of like, okay, how do I, how do I make something fast? And then how do I make something that could go outside and be celebratory and um, so COVID has given me like uh, some challenges and then also some, some time to play, which has been really nice. I also teach uh, at a local college. So it's been challenging that way to stay connected with students and um, navigate teaching online. So yeah, a mix of things. Well, we are just about at time now, so I want to make sure if there's any kind of closing thoughts that folks have that opportunity to, to add that piece to this. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad to see you all. Great to see everybody. <laughs> thank you so much, Kat. Yeah, thank, thank you, Kat. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, all. and thank you, Amy, as well. You, you, yes. You've yes. been oh, wonderful. Yes. Um, yeah. You guys are great. You and Kat, so great. fabulous. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you all. I mean, the, the exhibition really is phenomenal. Um, and to get to see the relationships that build on each other, not only um, in truth through something like this, where you have these conversations, but also just the proximity of your art now always connected through this exhibition. Um, so thank you all for, you. for participating in the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Galleries expanded dimension for Can I show you all something with design. Yes, I show yeah. it. I have a I have a little gallery up there. I want to show Marion. <gasps> oh, oh. 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 these are some of, I, again, I've loved your work forever. I just need you to know that. And these are that's my little mini gallery from <laughs> QSDS. Uh oh, wonderful. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> I I see you guys all the time. Thank you. What a gift. You well, know, there I am. I have a piece of your work too. <laughs> Not in here. <laughs> and thanks to Tracy for getting us all together. Absolutely. Yes. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Tracy. Hey, Hope Tracy. you're watching. What a great group. She yeah. will at some point. She's Tracy back. did an absolutely amazing job talking about all of us. And I've got to say, when she was talking about my work, she pointed out things that I hadn't thought about. And I was like, oh, wow, that makes sense. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she really did do a great job. So yeah. again, thank you all for joining today. I hope you enjoyed yourself. I hope our, our guests oh, enjoyed yes. the conversation. Oh, it was so great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody bye. have a great bye. rest of your bye. weekend. Bye. Happy bye. New Year. Bye. Nice bye. to meet you. Bye. 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 bye.